Our next speaker is Dan McKee, who is the Lieutenant Governor and is running to keep his seat as Lieutenant Governor. Uh, and he has focused on delivering results for Rhode Island families. He has worked to empower small businesses, hold corporate shareholders like National Grid accountable to consumers, and provide a first-class education to all Rhode Island students. Before serving as Lieutenant Governor, Dan McKee was the sixth-term Mayor of Cumberland. Welcome. Good evening, everybody, and I really appreciate the invitation uh, to be here. Um, just as a side note, before I kind of give you a real quick history of my, the work that I've been involved in and things that I believe in, um, I make an effort uh, to respond to anybody that calls our office and, uh, and, and reach out. And that's actually, I think, the reason that I'm here today. I think one of your members, one of the individuals that are very interested in the work that's being done by Indivisible, uh, reached out to me for a clarification on an issue, and I responded quickly and, and met with him for a cup of coffee, and uh, then he said, well, come on down, I'm having a meeting on June 6th, I think he had a meeting on June 6th, and I had a decline because my mom's 90th birthday was on June 6th, but I'm very happy to be here uh, this evening. And uh, we continue to do that uh, in terms of uh, reaching out, talking to people, whether it was an individual that uh, was uh, again reaching out to us, a homeless individual in, in, uh, in Providence, a, a former um, a, a veteran, and um, met with him, had him in our office, uh, and, and made sure that we were able to connect him into um, the right resources. And he had this ambition, quite frankly, to help uh, members, people who are homeless in the veterans area. And that was an easy thing for me, because as a mayor, we host the Operation Stand Down weekend, every weekend in the town of Cumberland. Uh, at our at our park, and um, you know, so you know, shifting into that area was just was just a natural. So, or whether it might be somebody, as we mentioned about the utility rates, uh, we've had a call from one family that was not in the poverty level, but is in that 200, 300, 400 times the poverty level uh, that is gotten caught in the cracks and are unable to qualify for assistance. And we've actually just put a a bill forward introduced it late in the session that it would really address that issue with the um, you know for those families that are that are in that area where they're uh, you know they're earning more than the poverty level but they're still uh, living at a at a point where they might be making thirty forty fifty thousand dollars in a in a in a household of four or more and have the expenses that they need to uh, carry so we're very um, you know involved with that and uh, and so anybody who calls our office the point I'm making is it's a response and they get a response from me uh, more often than not if not from the staff that we have Tony Silva's here as the chief of staff when I was a mayor of the town of Cumberland Tony Tony uh, served as a chief of police and uh, then he went on and, and, and he ran the uh, the police academy at CCRI for a decade or more so we make sure we respond on each and every call. Our office does answer the phone, just as I was a mayor or in my small businesses. We answer the phone and then we respond. And we do that in a way that I think is very, very proactive. So I'm happy to be here tonight to kind of just outline the things that, uh, that led me to the point where I'm Lieutenant Governor and also uh, where I think that, uh, you know, the work that we've been doing as Lieutenant Governor, of course, to answer your questions. Uh, that uh, that matter to us all in terms of um, you know making sure that we, we have safe communities to live in, fiscally sound communities, uh, great education, and an economy that can support the families that live in our live in our community. And so I'll just really quickly bring you through where how I got here. My dad started the Boys and Girls Boys Club in the town of Cumberland, and I was a member in the on the Boys Club. I became president of the Boys Club and the executive board. And uh, and turn and uh, and I was we were the first club to turn the name into the Boys and Girls Club, of a network which was the first Boys and Girls Club in the state of Rhode Island. Started the endowment fund. Susan and I, my wife Susan and I, uh, we uh, started our family. Uh, after I was president, I went from the boardroom into the gym, and that's why I'm so excited about Kobe was talking about his, his, the basketball program. I'm fully aware of that. He, he worked with Commissioner Pottington at the time, and uh, and and the whole crew there. And, and John was a mentor of mine who lived in Cumberland, who was our chief of police and, and federal marshal. So that was my introduction to young people, right, as a, as a coach. 
Uh, I just came from the training school and, and uh, the graduates there. I had a, I actually took out an envelope at the training school where I got a letter from one of the young men that I coached that spent some time in the training school and he said, you know, I'm sorry that I'm here, I don't belong here, and help me get out, and we did, and that young man, I wanted to deliver that message to uh, people actually that Kobe, one of the students that Kobe has mentored, uh, that we wanted to deliver that message to young people that, uh, that uh, some people have more hurdles to jump than others, uh, but we have to keep on encouraging everybody to, to jump those hurdles and get to where they need to go. Uh, I, can, I can report that those kids that I coached that spent some time there now raising their families, they have a, uh, you know, they have homes and they're, and they're in very good productive lives in their, in their mid-30s and they're still in my life today. In fact, I uh, went to a destination wedding of one of the kids I coached in Cancun last year. And so that was a young man that couldn't even, couldn't even go over a bridge, never mind be on a plane, when we actually started to get to know one another and, and uh, very proud to have had that experience. So that puts me in a spot where I really do understand to as best a degree as someone like myself can uh, the issues that young people go through and, and why we really need to double down on their interests, whether it's in education or whether it's in job training or whether it might be in, in just mentoring uh, and providing opportunity to young people. Because I believe that it's very important for the state of Rhode Island to understand that we need to really have young people listen to the advocacy in our state. 100,000 people are going to be turning 65 or older by 2030 in the state of Rhode Island. And if we don't double down on the young people and keep them here, retain them here, and attract them here, we're not going to have a, an economy that actually can, can um, uh, you know, deliver and provide the services uh, that we want to deliver in the state of Rhode Island. That's a big gap that we need to talk about. And so what I'm talking about in the, even in the campaign, the fact that we need to figure out about student loans, there are programs right now where uh, uh, businesses are starting to pick up portions of not all student loans. There are governments, local, both municipalities, one municipality in the, in the country that actually is understanding that you need to, uh, uh, to help uh, um, you know, young people. Uh, that's the second largest debt level in the entire country, uh, second to, uh, to, to mortgages, is in the student loan, and we have to do something there to really make sense. In addition to that, we're talking about uh, housing issues and a, ability for people to uh, get involved in housing. I've been in business as well as a business person, not only in the nonprofits working with young people, but in business as well. So I understand the, how difficult it is to run a small business and the challenges that we have in, in the state uh, to do that. And uh, so I think it's very important that we make sure that. Uh, and one of the businesses I was in was a realtor. When I first got out of college, I decided I wasn't going to be in the political science of my degree or education that I had. I went to business. And uh, I understand the housing is a really important issue. And entry-level housing for young people that we're going to retain and have these young people and vibrant people in the state of Rhode Island, then we have to address that. So we're going to be talking about that in our campaign. So, not, so I just kind of outlined my business experience. I've been involved in business for quite, many, quite a few years. Uh, my family has been involved in a, in a, in a business in the town of Cumberland uh, for well over 100 years, which started as a nice business and now is a plumbing and heating business that my brothers run after my dad died in 86. So that led me to the community service of, of getting involved in local government. So I was involved in the town of Cumberland uh, as a member of the Boys and Girls Club and civic engagement like that, but also I started to get involved in local government as I think this organization is right spot on. You need people to be involved, you need people who vote, you need people who are engaged. I believe in that uh, 100%. When I became mayor of the town of Cumberland, and I certainly will offer any help and assistance that Kobe might need, the mayor back there, the future mayor, uh, of Providence, uh, we inherited a five, uh, a five point downgrade on our bond rating the day before I took office. Uh, and during the time, we would not, we had a meeting with the state within the first two weeks and we were 90 days away in the town of Cumberland uh, from a, uh, a, a government a state intervention on our town finances. And during that time frame that I was mayor, we had eight bond upgrades. And during that time, we invested in our police, we invested in our rescue, we invested in our infrastructure, we did over $50 million of public school improvements. Uh, that's a shame when I hear that schools, when I walk through Hope High School and that school, the lights are not even on. 
Somebody needs to turn the lights on. And so we participated in a way that uh, we kept our schools in, in good shape. Uh, they always can be better. Um, but I think it's shameful uh, when we start talking about education uh, that we're not uh, really investing in the way that we should. Uh, I certainly have been a leader on that. It's been a, um, a lightning rod issue to get involved in public education as a mayor, but I did. Uh, our school system had two failed elementary schools at the same time with that five point downgrade and when I became mayor. Uh, I did not think that that was right. I thought a mayor's responsibility was to make sure that the entire health of the community was important and I did something about it. I opened up an office of children, youth and learning uh, when, when the chief was the chief. And also I, I, I went even further than that and opened up mayoral academies and pushed for that because I believe that we need to take a clean shape, sheet of paper out to solve some of these very complicated problems we have. And one of those is education. And one of those areas in education right now that I hear a lot of lip service on, which really disturbs me, is the fact that right now the Hispanic uh, population, the Hispanic students in the state of Rhode Island are the lowest performing uh, student population in the entire country. Uh, yet uh, we give a lot of big hustle to that. And I think we should be a whole lot more aggressive. And I'm going to continue to be an advocate for that. And then some of the things that we're doing in the office, and I'll kind of wait, I know that you're going to open up some questions, but there are many things in our office, in the Lieutenant Governor's office, that are uh, our statute, and I think you need to really, uh, we, we've made sure that we paid close attention to that. So I chair the Small Business Advocacy Council. Um, we had a meeting yesterday morning, we meet quarterly, and we talk about trying to advance the small business friendliness in the state. These are. Uh, these are businesses that are employing better than 50% of the people who, uh, who live in the state of Rhode Island, and yet very little attention has been given to the small business community. And so we, and I don't mind, I, as, as a mayor, we, we work to bring CVS and expand CVS by 600,000 square feet in our town, and I was happy to do that and do everything I could to make sure that that happened. But we also got to take care of the local businesses, the local businesses that are really the backbone. And I've made an effort to make sure that that is, that is happening. We are showing progress. I can get a lot more detail on that, but I want to tell you that we spend time on that. Uh, we, uh, from working with the businesses, working with the small businesses, talking about energy costs, which was mentioned uh, in, when I was introduced, we intervene with the Public Utility Commission on any, any docket that we think uh, impacts a business, a small business, or as we found out, there was an unlevel playing field between the ratepayers' interest and the shareholders' interest. And we, our office, uh, have led the charge right up to today when the tax change came in, in December and lowered the corporate tax from 35% to 22%. Uh, we, we, we recognized that there was a, a windfall, a tax windfall for the, for the national grid and the utilities, and we we're very public about the fact that those dollars belonged in the ratepayers' pockets, not in the shareholders' pockets. So far, about $28 million has been realized that's going to offset increases in the fall, and we're still fighting for about seven to nine million dollars uh, that uh, because the tax saving began in January. So we have no problem pushing back against anyone that uh, you know is 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 not uh, you know is taking advantage of us uh, and the people in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, we continue to work on long-term health care uh, because that's, I chair that board, I co-chair that board, I, uh, and we're working on, just came from a meeting this morning about the Alzheimer's epidemic in the state of Rhode Island, and we've raised money, we inherited a five-year plan, that is sunsetting, and we've raised money, outside money, uh, that can, uh, is going to actually put forth another five-year plan and bring in all the unbelievable research that's happening in the, in the state. And I fully expect that that report is going to not only lead uh, in a way to help the families that are suffering through Alzheimer's, but also is going to help researchers in the state. And I believe we'll bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, as a result of that to go to come in our state, which is good for our economy, but it's also good for those families that are suffering through Alzheimer's. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. I mean, there's a whole lot more I could talk about. We've inherited veterans issues, as I said, with Operation Stand Down. Our, our office is in care and custody of the, uh, of the uh, God and the Heroes, which we honor the uh, individuals that um, have, have, have died uh, for our freedoms since 9-11. We continue to work with the Gold Star moms and, and families. Uh, Operation Holiday Cheer, we dispatch, um, I think, almost 600 care packages this year to 
uh, veteran, uh, to servicemen and women who are either deployed or dispatched during the holidays. Uh, so that work continues. And, uh, and uh, as I started, um, the, being here today, is, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, certainly would answer any questions that you may have about anything and everything. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Yes. Operation Stand Down, which is an organization I just discovered existed a few months ago when I interviewed for um, an, an article uh, in uh, Streetside um, uh, newspaper, um, helps um, for, uh, helps veterans with PTSD and also helps them find housing too. Uh, and the person I interviewed had gone through a horrific childhood and managed at the time that I was interviewing him uh, to have housing. And this is something that goes on all over Rhode Island. It's a wonderful organization. I'm glad that you're working on it. But it's not the only, uh, veterans who are at risk are not the only people who have problems with homelessness. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, your experience working with an outstanding organization like that has given you some ideas about the general homelessness population. Yeah, and, and it, that's true. Uh, we certainly are responding to the individual cases as that um, uh, gentleman that had uh, called us who was homeless and now he's in a, in a uh, you know, in, in an apartment that is uh, you know, servicing him well. Yeah, I, I don't think that work ever ends. I mean, when we're, you know, we're, uh, we were the first uh, community in the state of Rhode Island that actually had an affordable housing plan approved by the state of Rhode Island that was under the time that I was mayor, so the focus is there. We converted um, property, as uh, has been talked about, as in, in a small way, because Cumberland's a little smaller than some of the other districts. But we know that um, homelessness is in every community. We do know from the education reports that we've done that 38% of your poverty, 38% of your poverty is outside of urban districts. So when we talk about just uh, urban districts, we should. But why would you give? Why would you only service 62 percent of the of the issues that we're dealing with? Uh, so yes, I, I've been we've been focused on that, uh, you know, to the degree that we can. Uh, we have visited. I mean, we have worked with. Um, uh, I, I didn't get into the fact that we had put I had put together municipal leaders in a real interesting way in, in East Greenwich and included uh, to help with health health insurance costs and other things. But right now, I've just we've just brought them all in on the opioid addiction issue. And, we're, and we have now um, launched a, an effort, and a, kind of a long way to answer your question, but there's, there's, there's things that happen that create this problem, right, or this issue. So um, we, we brought all those communities in. Uh, we're, right now they're participating in a national law, uh, lawsuit uh, that hopefully is going to bring in uh, 30 communities are already involved in the state of Rhode Island. And I think that we're going to bring substantial resources in for the rehab education and the and the research that needs to be had in, in that area to hold the hold the manufacturers and the distributors of the uh, accountable in a way that they should be just like the tobacco industry but in this case money's going to flow to the communities and then we're going to talk about those things so we know that and so inside of that journey not only are we doing that but we're also visiting uh, things that are uh, actively going on right now in the community so we're, we're visiting those shelters that are serving those those meals those 30,000 meals a month, that, and, 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 and housing 105 people right on, right on Cranston Tree in Providence and other areas. So, yeah, I mean, you do what one man can do, but, you're, but clearly it's a, you know, it's not something that you, that we've turned uh, back on. We try and do what we can do. I think on the, I think that communities can do better. We had um, a, uh, a shelter in our town that I, uh, the, for the aid shelter that opened up when, uh, before it was even uh, acceptable and we certainly supported that. So yeah, it's a, it's a whole package, but if you have more ideas based on your information, please share them with us. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Do you support raising the minimum wage here in Rhode Island with $50 an hour? So I think that it's a good goal. I think that we have to be careful in terms of how quickly you do it. And I, and I do believe that you, have, you should be um, understanding and, and, and fiscal notes should be really attached to it in a very serious way um, and to understand that if, if you raise it too sharply and then you have businesses that don't want to open up here and they end up going to areas where the minimum wage is less, um, I think that you, you, you know, you've got to be capital. I think it's a good goal. My feeling is you should establish something, put a CPI into it so that you could, it's a continuous movement and it's not stagnant the way it has been over the last few years. 
Um, but I also think that, as I talked earlier, is that we should be also very focused on the education uh, because uh, if you right now we're we're still struggling in areas, and the education really uh, positions people uh, to to earn a whole lot more than fifteen dollars an hour. And my goal has always been is to increase per capita income in our communities, and so if people who are earning at any level, they're you know I think you need to invest to make that happen. Yes. Yeah, on education, you champion a former charter school that um, doesn't have to pay for the annual wage or into the state pension system. Um, Betsy Boss has kind of uh, highlighted as a, uh, a great system. So I was wondering if you could kind of speak on that connection or why. Yeah, so I don't look at it the way you just described, okay? Because the the, the wage there is significantly, you know, uh, you know, higher on step than the than than some of the, you know some of the local communities. It also provides social security for those teachers, and I think it's an absolute shame that in the state of Rhode Island, that two thirds of our teachers work without a social security benefit. I've been on I've been publicly stating that that shouldn't change. Uh, so when you take the retirement benefit that, that the, those, those teachers have plus the Social Security, they actually have a better retirement plan than 60% of the state of Rhode Island, and it's, and it's solvent. So, uh, yeah, so as far as the outcomes, the first graduating class is going to graduate on Saturday. 70% uh, free and reduced lunch. Um, over That class uh, has, is, is achieving 25 to 30 points higher than their peers in the in the descending district schools, and uh, and the Hispanic community is 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 achieving at those levels 20, 25 points higher on on you know reading skills and math skills. Those kids are going to schools like uh, that are coming from Central Falls, Pawtucket, Cumberland, Lincoln. They're going to Tufts. They're going to Holy Cross. They're going to PC. They're going to uh, the uh, the uh, Naval Academy. Uh, we have a whole lot more to do. Uh, and I'm, do I, I'm all in on public education. All in on public education. I, I tell you, our schools in the town of Cumberland, which I described earlier, which we're struggling, are now the fastest improving district in the state of Rhode Island. So we invested in the public schools. I'm all in for public schools, and I think that there's things to learn. Uh, and I think that some people should be embracing uh, where things are going well in a way that uh, they're not. And I think that we would learn a lot more, especially about this Hispanic learning gap that's currently in the state of Rhode Island. Um, you've said one of your goals is delivering results for Rhode Island fam uh, for families. And in that vein, being able to decide the size of your family is really important. So I'd like to know where you stand on reproductive rights and specifically the Reproductive Health Care Act, which we've been working really hard to get. Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that question, because that was the phone call that I received from Roy about that. And I have, I, I have been uh, for uh, the right to choose for women's health. I've been on the record for that. Uh, in an interview that happened that described as I'm being, uh, you know, uh, criticized about legislation that's currently in place that would codify uh, the Roe versus Wade in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, you know, I, I, they failed to say that in that same interview that I supported the Roe versus Wade, I also support the women's right to choose. And I think, and, and I, so, so yeah, so I, I support that in, the, in the terms of, you know, that I historically have supported that. Is there something that you can, you can help along with? Is there some things that you can help us with? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, we're, you know, I think there's a number of women's issues that, uh, you know, uh, that, that we need to keep on working on. And I, we're working with a number of young college students, uh, a couple of them here today, and uh, that they're talking about uh, sexual violence on campus. You know, we certainly would be, are going to be supporting uh, moves in that area, and, and of course, the, uh, the women's health issues the, the same. So I, I'm glad you asked that question, because that actually what is the reason I think I was invited here today, is a clarification on that. And I think that it's important that we really set records straight and, 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 and have people understand exactly where you stand. And I'm more than willing to answer the questions in public about that, whether I'm in a, in a group of, uh, you know, that you know, disagree with me or whether they agree with me, I think you have a right to know. And, and we need to keep on pushing people out to the polls, as was suggested earlier, earlier today. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, we really don't have time, but thank you.